Hello again, and welcome back for our fifth episode in the series on painting a Song of Ice and Fire tabletop game miniatures. In this episode, we'll be painting all of the metallic areas, blocking them in with a dark mixture of black ink and silver acrylic paint. As I mentioned in the previous episode, I use a mixture of black ink and silver acrylic paint to give me a slightly off black that is slightly glossy that, after varnishing, I will be using as the base for dry brushing on the silver acrylic once again to give the metallic effect. At this stage of the game, it won't look like much, but we're just blocking in the colors, and it will help us fill in most of the blank areas left on our miniatures. We've covered all of the primary colors, and I don't think we'll be going to any different colors in the future. So now is the time to put this on, fix any of the small mistakes we made while blocking in the other colors, and all of the steps from here on out are going to be refining what we've already put on. Off to the right there, I'm just mixing up my colors now. I'm using just a couple of drops of Flow Improver added to a mixture of black ink and silver acrylic to try and help thin out that acrylic. The medium in the ink itself is not quite enough to bring it down to the consistency that I want for this. In fact, if I just used the ink and the silver, it would be perfectly opaque. And even with the thinner, it's still going to be quite dark, you'll probably notice as we begin to apply it to the miniatures. This is intentional because we're going to be using this to opaquely fill in all of the areas the silver goes over. The silver acrylic paint itself doesn't look very good when it's applied on a light color, or really on any color at all, it being a semi-transparent paint to begin with. As such, having a dark underlayer is essential to getting the proper metallic look to it. Since we want our silver to be mostly on the highlighted areas in any case, and for this color to be serving as our shade color when we're applying the silver in the future, we're going to actually want this base color to affect the raised areas much more than we have with our previous washes. While I still add some Flow Improver to help it still highlight the raised areas, this gives me an idea of what I'm going to be trying to highlight later on when I'm dry brushing, I do keep it much more opaque than any of the other washes have so far. I'm also only going to put one layer of this on. We're not going to be going back and richening it as we do with the other colors, so we want it to be opaque enough to stand on its own right now. Block it in, give yourself an idea of where your metals are going to lie, and carry on from there. This will be a step for particular caution though. This is the most opaque color we will use and have used in this project, and so mistakes with this will not be as easily corrigible as with other colors. If you do end up going over the lines at any point, you can still salvage it by wicking it away with a brush as with any other color that we've shown so far. However, you'll want to move quickly to do so. The more of it that sets up, the harder it'll be to wash over later. I do make a couple such mistakes while doing this, and fortunately they're all salvageable, because as Bob Ross said, everything is just a happy little accident when we're painting. Just take care, and try not to get too discouraged as you go along. The other thing to note as you apply this base color is that your thinner will be tending towards gelling up as you go along. Be conscious of the consistency of your ink paint mixture, and continue thinning or remixing as necessary. As with previous episodes, I'll include an index in the description for all the sections where I interject through the music. Aside from that, I'll leave you to the footage.
As I blocked in the clasps on the Blackfish's cloak, the buckle on his belt, and now the rivets on his saddle, I've gone over the lines a little bit on each of those details, because my brush just isn't that fine and my hands are a little shaky. That's not too much of a disaster though, because this color will also be serving as the shading for our metallic areas. If we dry brush and are somewhat careful while applying our silver later on, these darkened areas will just serve as a bit of an outline, or maybe a shadow, for the areas that we've decided are metallic. When you think you've smudged something, or gone a little bit outside of where you meant to, always take a minute to look at it and think of how this might help you later on, because often, erasing an issue is not quite as easy as making it work for you later.
As I work around the chainmail here, you can get a pretty good idea of how thin I've made this color. It's not as thin as any of the other colors by any stretch of the imagination. It's just enough that I can get a little bit of a see-through effect when I'm going on to raised surfaces that are very notable. This will help me visualize the light areas a little bit, and should help cover up any areas I miss if I'm dry brushing later. The downside to this is that in the glare of bright lights, such as those I have set up to try and amplify my lighting situation at my painting desk, I can sometimes lose track of edges and leave them unpainted. As such, in future episodes, you'll definitely see me just touching up here and there whenever I notice that something didn't actually get painted. That's not too much of an issue, since this color blends well with itself, and the addition of thinner means that any layer I add on over top should be indistinguishable from the rest fairly shortly thereafter. On top of that, just flat black can be used to touch this up fairly easily. A couple of edges that are just flat black should be largely indistinguishable from the rest once the entire thing has been varnished and I've gone on to the dry brushing stage.
Here again, I'm confronted by tiny rivets too small for me to accurately paint with shaky hands and a wide brush. You could, of course, buy a thinner brush, but this is among the thinnest brushes I have, and definitely one of my best. As such, I'm happy to make do with it. In this case in particular as well, we're looking at another situation where any overpainting I do can just serve as a bit of a shadow for the rivet later on when I silver the tip of it. Once I'm doing the silvering, using a relatively dry brush is going to be very important to make sure that I just get the edges, but in this case, shading all around it will help that silver really stand out from the brown in any case. When the alternative was having this brigand bean just be a flat brown, I really wasn't going to leave these rivets unpainted. Try not to let things like that stop you. Try to look at ways that you can turn them to your advantage. Or, I guess, buy a pointier brush and get a set of your hand. Like I mentioned in the introduction, I'm always looking out to make sure that the consistency of my paint is exactly what I want it to be. Now that I've noticed my paint starting to gel up and not flow as well onto and off with the brush as I'd like it to, I'm going to put in one part of each of my three components, that is to say the black ink, the silver acrylic paint, and the flow improver, and mix them back together. The addition of all three of these should bring some of the rest of the puddle that was previously gelling up into the mix as well. So you probably don't need to add a huge amount and make a full new batch. The flow improver will help the rest of it liquefy again and make it back into a usable form. Here, while trying to paint the chainmail I saw as visible through the armpit slits of her gambeson, I left a streak of the black paint across Ms. Mormont's cloak. As I've mentioned before, it's very readily apparent when you put it onto something with pale colors, such as those we've been working with so far. The fact that it's great at covering those up when we made mistakes also unfortunately means it's great at covering those up in the places we don't want it to. In this situation, to remedy that, I've grabbed a dry, clean brush, and I've just brushed away all of the wet paint I could find. And now I'm adding some flow improver to my palette, adding that to the brush itself, and using it to blend that streak in with the rest of the color underlying it. Since this is supposed to be the sort of dirty, tan leather side of the cloak, a little bit of smudging isn't too bad, I'm just going to turn it into texture.
Looking ahead to doing the front of her skirts, I've already seen a very pointy little nook where I'm going to need to get right up into a tight corner. As such, when I charge my brush here, I'm going to give it a good twist. Keep that point on so I can poke it up in there and not spill over onto the skirts nearby. I want to keep that blue as pristine as possible. Brianna always struck me as the kind of person who'd take great pride in her nightly equipment because of all of the trouble she's had in earning it. Here again, I'm refreshing the consistency of my paint. I'd never noticed this before and certainly wasn't going by any particular timer, but it looks like each time is about 10 minutes apart, so maybe we can use that as something of a guide for the working time of the Vallejo Flow Improver. I'll be looking for that in the future. At least now I can rest assured that even if you haven't learned anything from watching this, I learned something from making this video.
All right, and that concludes our painting for today. Today we've gone over mixing together a mixture of black ink and silver acrylic with a little bit of flow improver in order to block in our metallic areas on our miniatures. I hope this has been educational to you and I thank you very much for watching. Next episode we'll work on deepening some of our colors and adding a second coat to some of our miniatures. Until then, go play some games! <laughs>